Thank you very much. Um, I, I sort of that was a great introduction, and you made people laugh, and um, and then Michelle made people cry, and and all all very good. Um, loads of people have been asking me. That I've been bumping into people I haven't seen for a long time, and they ask me, you know, am I well? And the automatic English response is, yeah, I'm feeling fine. Right, I'm going to be honest with you, I feel terrible. The dreadful night's sleep. You know, I feel a bit like a, a junior doctor having, you know, when they haven't done seven days. That's a joke. <laughs> um, I work for an organisation called Turning Point. Oh, I should say this before I say anything else. I know that um, you know, some of you will know that I'm on the board of NHS England, and so I have to say this before I progress. And this is going to sound a bit like those, you know, those radio adverts for cars or financial products, and the voice comes afterwards and says, anything I do say from now on is not representative of the NHS England board, its chair, or any members thereof. It is a purely personal reflection, not representing the Secretary of State or any atom of NHS England's views, policies, or actions thereof. <laughs> so, you, 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 you're getting a view from me. I know that there's this primary care GP forward view coming and I don't know anything about it. <laughs> I don't know what's coming. What I will say, and I'll say this from me, and I'll also say it from, from Turning Point, um, you're not alone, all right? You're not alone. Um, the press view, I don't know whether this is deliberate, I think it is. Um, I come from a family um, steeped in the NHS. My mother was a nurse. Uh, she trained in Nigeria in the 50s, then she came over here, and because we had casual racism and croup, she had to retrain. That was also a joke. Not as good as yours, but there you go. She had to retrain, and I often, we have this joke, me and my mum, about the fact that she's probably the only nurse in England that can cure snake bite. And she and I and our family always were brought up to have a deep respect for people who are really smart because you are, you got better A levels than me, um, and chose to, chose to do something other than go into banking. Right? And um, I think uh, every opportunity that I have to stand and talk to you should, should include a, a thank you, a personal thank you for the work that you do for my family and for me. Um, I used to joke at one point that getting an appointment with my GP, I had to be bleeding from the eyes. <laughs> God, that's not your fault. That's a system fault. But I appreciate personally the work that you do and the efforts that you make and the, the sacrifices that you make and the ingenuity that you bring to the provision of personal um, health care. And I think we don't hear that enough. What you do is fantastic. Um, I also want to say that, you know, it is possible I'll talk about determinants of health and social care in, in a minute. It's all important. It is possible for us to help each other walk a very long and deep ditch of despair. It is possible to become incredibly pessimistic about the future. But I'm going to say something to you that hopefully, well, it may seem controversial, but it's not meant to be. If the future isn't created by you and us, who else is going to do it? Who else is going to do it? I think that everyone in this room, including me, in some senses, has far too much of an opportunity, far too many opportunities, far too many gifts to be pessimistic. We have to be optimistic on behalf of the people who aren't in this room. And I offer, as Turning Point's chief exec, we employ 4,000 people. We provide services to, I don't know, um, well, uh, about 60, 61,000 people across England and a bit of Wales. Our clients are at the sharp end of Tudor Hearts inverse care law, uh, mental health, substance misuse, learning disabilities. Uh, primary care services, employment. I'm offering my organisation and our staff 
as partners in your desire to deliver the future of healthcare and to reverse the inverse care law. So that's my offer to you. It's a thank you and it's a partnership. That's what we, we have to do this together. We have to, we have to create a future for other people outside this room. I've got a few hats on. Uh, Chief Executive Turning Point, I chair, I set up a think tank called Collaborate. It was all about the future of services to the public. Yes, I'm a non-executive member of, uh, board member of NHS England. Um, I didn't vote for any, any aspect of the Health and Social Care Bill. To this day, I am shocked that I got um, appointed to the board of NHS England. But I think somebody thought we best have him inside the tent pissing out. Uh, <laughs> Um, and that's, that's not a bad thing because I, 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 I think my duty on NHS England is to is actually to be, make people feel a bit uncomfortable. Um, I, I don't, I've got all my gongs, my ego is assuaged, I don't need to, um, I don't seek approval in any of these positions and um, if things need to be said I will say them and I'm not that bothered about being popular <laughs> um, as you can probably tell. So, the determinants of, of health. I mean, this is, for me, I'll, I'm going to run through this because you all kind of know. You, you work in London. You know, I, I chaired the, um, the London Fairness Commission, which, as a report, I would recommend that you read um, because it's a kind of call for you and us to own what fairness is in London. We talk to five, five and a half, six thousand people, and they all confirm what we know. You know, the determinants of health, determinants of health, social care, are all, about, are all about poverty. They're all about who you are, where you were born, what chances you started with in life, and what those chances provide you with as you, as you go through life. We know from Michael Marmot, I remember, you know, Michael Marmot gave, gave this brilliant presentation about employment. <laughs> um, and he was talking about the fact that the governments, successive governments, have, 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 have led us into uh, economic situations where huge swathes of industries have gone, unemployment's gone up. Uh, we had the, uh, the crisis in 2008. Uh, someone once said to me, well, th the NHS is unlike no other industry in the world. It's absolutely true, this is said to me. Not like no, no other industry in the world. It's not like banking. I mean, if the banks go bust, if the bank goes bust, nobody dies. Yeah, that was absolutely true. I said, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Michael Marmot pointed out, having studied, you know, we all know who Michael Marmot is, that for every 1% increase in unemployment, there's a 0.1% increase in suicide. Direct correlation. Unemployment kills people. We also know that for every one month someone is unemployed, their mental health deteriorates, depression, anxiety. We know that. These are choices. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't think that austerity is an economic, it's not like gravity. It's a choice. What we've decided to do as a nation, because we voted for the Conservative government, is to try and pay off the mortgage, a 25 year mortgage, in five years, which we can do. You know, anybody who's got a mortgage, I'm sure that, you know, you can do it. The problem is, your kids starve, you can't afford clothing, the house is freezing, you pay your mortgage off at the end of five years, but you'll be incredibly cold, incredibly thin, everybody will hate you, and your life will be miserable. That's what we've decided to do as a nation. And it's one of the reasons why you're faced with the challenges that you're faced with. The fact of the matter is, people living in poor areas, we all know, generate the kind of demand um, that you're seeing. They die sooner. They spend more of their lives with disability. On average, the, the total difference um, between rich and poor, 17 years. And in London, those fluctuations literally shift as you get on the tube line at Westminster and get off at Stratford. That's the dynamic in which we work. And we don't pay enough attention to that as a health system. I have to, I'll say it now, I think the NHS England doesn't pay enough attention to it. It's seen as an edge issue, 
something on the edge of the policy debate, not at the centre of it. And yet, even if you don't care, even if you're a hard-hearted mother who doesn't think that people at the sharp end in the inverse care law deserve anything, just look at the cost. And I won't, I won't go, the numbers, you know, are important, but let me just illustrate something from one of our services that I visited recently, where we employ doctors and nurses to work with our uh, 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 people with substance misuse and mental health and learned disabilities. And I, was, I walked into this service, um, I think it was in Kent, this chap walked up to me and um, he was coughing. Now, I'm not a doctor, but somebody coughed. <coughs> I'm thinking, well, you know, there's something wrong with him. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting there, do you know what I mean? Okay, there's something wrong with him. And um, we had a chat and he told me that he'd, throughout his life he'd been taking drugs and alcohol. And, and actually, in this particular area, as in most areas that Turning Point works, where it's substance misuse, I reckon we're dealing with this, some of the illest people walking. You know, any iller, you're in hospital, basically. And this guy's coughing. And I um, say to one of our primary care professionals, look, um, what are we going to do with this guy? And he said, well, you know, he probably needs maybe antibiotics, a bronchitis, something like that. I said, oh, great, we can deal with that particular individual there and then. He said, no, 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 we can't. So why not? Well, we're not commissioned to deliver <laughs> that service. I said, where's he going to go? He said, well, we'll send him to his GP. I said, what are the chances of him going to his GP? He said, about 2%. I said, so he's not going to go to his GP, is he? He said, well, he might, he might not. You know, if he does, he's in a bit of a state. As the likelihood is, he's going to end up in A&E at some point earlier than he should have done, you know, totally preventable. I said, how often does this happen? He said, well, we've got about 2,500 people, 1,900 times, yeah? So even if you don't care about that individual, think of the cost, think of the complete waste of time and money associated with that one individual who wasn't homeless. <laughs> The reason why I was so determined to fight for and win the contract for the Camden Homelessness, Specialist Homelessness Service, which I hope there are people from that service in the audience. Are they here? Come on, don't be shy. Anyway, they've, they've got a workshop later on. Is because that shouldn't be happening. And I don't want it happening on my watch. But the system, the system almost colludes to make it, make it happen. So, poverty, that's the widest determinant, really. We all know that, you know that. You can strip it down. You know that the 14 poorest boroughs in London are driving cost, driving demand. Those individuals are in and out of A&E. They're, they're in and out of your surgeries. They are a burden. What do we do about it? Well. You have a massive challenge with your workloads. Your, the demands upon you seem to me to be literally you know, Im impossible, the work that you have to do. And I think one of the ways forward is partnerships with organizations that can help you manage that demand um, by helping you to design or work with us to reach into those communities to prevent that demand and ending up on your doorstep. Um, Michelle asked earlier about whether you have patient, um, whether you talk to your patients, and a lot of you put your hands up. And Turning Point's gone one step further than that. We actually designed a service, and I'll, I won't, I'll cut a long story short, that worked with communities at the sharp end of the inverse care law and asked the question, simple question, why don't you use the services that are available in your community before you're in crisis? Simple question, you know. And the answer came back, we don't understand them. So you go to some of these estates that are health and social care deserts. I think that's a, not, an, not an extreme description. And you talk to people 
And what you get, it's the equivalent of, I don't know, you going into a shop and you want to buy a dress. And before you've opened your mouth, a shopkeeper will give you a bin liner. And you're thinking, hang on a minute, I come in for the dress. And if you know, we only, we've only got bin liners. And you say, I'll tell you what, I'd rather go cold than put that on. And you walk out. Right? You don't understand the service. It's not designed for you. The problem is, and the problem for the public purse and the problem for the health system, is that we're paying for the shop, the bin liners, and the shopkeeper. What we did was design, help people design and deliver services that kept them out of your surgeries, that supported them to help each other. It's our view and my view, and I think there is much evidence for this, certainly when we did the review of the Connected Care Programme, we found that for every one pound invested, there was a return of four pound 44, that's for the economists in the room. But really what it did is it showed that you don't need to be as qualified as anyone in this room to prevent, to help people look after themselves, to give them confidence in their own communities, to pay for their expertise. This isn't big society. I was at the launch of the big society. I've got to be honest, it's one, one of the funniest and most fatuous experiences I've ever had in my life. This is about working with communities to build their confidence, build their social capital in such a way that they can get the resources to design services that can partner with you and organisations like us to help them understand the services they need and to help run those services. And it's in, in my view, it's in building those kinds of partnerships that we get the understanding of the real nature, the real gift of the, the NHS, the real gift of your desire to serve and to support into the communities where it matters. Because it's only by building those coalitions, only by building those practical responses and those real understandings that, in my view, we're going to build the NHS of the future. I think that we can't afford pessimism. We just can't afford it. We have to build a positive future on behalf of the people who aren't in this room. The future for me is very clear. It's about collaboration with communities. It's about collaboration with organisations that share your values, that work with and treat the people that you care about, not just the people at the sharp end of the inverse care law, but those are the people, the, the, the multiple comorbidities, the people who, who are they're not hard to reach, that services don't reach. Those are the people that are costing the NHS in both money and energy. The future is about building, building a future together for the people who aren't in this room. I hope that on behalf of my organisation, on behalf of me personally, my children and your children too, that we can stay optimistic, positive enough and creative enough, and creative enough to build that future together. Thank you very much.